John, how you doing today? Great. How are you, well, Billy? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited that you're coming on. It's been a while since you and I have connected and spoken. Um, and I'm excited to dive in because you probably more than anyone have done the most research out there that I can imagine on near-death experiences, on people's claims of dying, um, of visiting heaven, of meeting Jesus. I mean, there's so many of these stories. We've seen them in films like Heaven is for Real and uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven, and there's so many others. But let's just kind of start because I want to get into the book that you wrote on this. Um, but let's start with where your interest for this topic came. Yeah, so Billy, I was actually an agnostic um, when my dad was dying of cancer, and uh, I mean this is back in the late seventies. So give my giving myself away of how old I am. <laughs> uh, but it was the very someone gave him the very first research on these near death experiences. It was it was actually they coined it near death experience, and I saw it on his books on his side table, and I. And I picked it up and I just started reading and I couldn't stop. And by the end of it, I said, oh my gosh, this God stuff may be real. And it actually opened me up so that when someone invited me into a small group Bible study the next year, I started studying the Bible and I came to faith in Jesus. And I, I've since I went from a career in engineering into ministry. And over the last 35 That's years- a big I've, jump, by the way. That's a big- yeah. You know. Well, and, and, and I say that because I, I have a very analytical mind, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to just, you know, take leaps of faith. I, I need evidence. I need reason. And after studying over a thousand of these near death experience accounts, because I've always been curious, you know, I, I mean, I've been to seminary, I've studied the Bible, I've taught it for, you know, 30 plus years. Um, and at the same time, I've always been curious. So I have collected and studied over a thousand of these near-death experiences. And I've always been trying to put it together. How does it fit with the heaven of the Bible and the God of the Bible? And, um, and so that's why I wrote Imagine Heaven, to show the amazing correlation with the commonalities of what people say. And that's commonalities uh, around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that every individual's interpretation of what they experienced aligns with what the Bible says. And that's a very important thing to remember. Um, the reports that are common amazingly align, but these people are having an experience that I've come to believe is truly beyond our four dimensions of time and space. So, yeah. you know, it's like, imagine um, if we're living this life on a flat black and white picture on the wall, and death means separation. So you're ripped off that two-dimensional plane and brought out into three dimensions of color. You experience this new dimensional world and you can see your flat world. It's contained within this larger world. And then imagine being pressed back in to that painting and having to express to those two-dimensional people in what three dimensions of color are like, but in two-dimensional black and white terms. And I'm convinced after interviewing so many of these people, that's what they're trying to do. So they have to interpret their experience and they always do in their own worldview. And that's very important to understand because not every interpretation uh, aligns with the Bible, but I've found incredibly the commonalities are pointing to the God of the Bible and, and, and no one else. Yeah. Well, and that's that's what's interesting. Even going back to what you were saying, you have a very analytical mind. You're sitting there next to your dad. You're reading this book. The book actually takes you from agnosticism into belief. You're making you say maybe this is true. You know, one well, not of the totally. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't there yet. I was just like what hit me is this is medical scientific evidence. I mean, these right. this many people saying this, what does it mean? And and then I started to research. And then I did find you know, reasons to believe it's not just hallucination or, um, you know, uh, the, the, the brain effects of firing. a dying brain. Right. Why do people say that? So that's really when it comes into the, that seems to be the most common explanation. Oh, it's just people's brains, you know, when they're under duress or it's, you know, it's almost like this dream sequence that people, um, you know, say that that's what this is. What makes you say, no, that's not the case. 
Yeah, and and the very reason for that, I believe, is why this is a new apologetic. I believe this is a gift from God, a global apologetic in this age of modern medical resuscitation and and science. And um, and and here's why I said this. You know, by the way, uh, very important for Christians to understand. I think Paul had a near death experience in Acts chapter fourteen. He says it says he was stoned to death and drug out of the city and left for dead. <laughs> And, and then he gets back up and goes back into the city, <laughs> miraculously. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, talking about himself 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but I was taken up into heaven and saw and heard things inexpressible. So he's talking about, I believe, that experience 14 years earlier in Acts 14. Now, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is what people around the world say. When they die, they leave their bodies but they still have a body. It's a spiritual body, right? And they say not just five senses. It's more like they have 50 senses. They're still themselves. In fact, they're more themselves, they say, than they've ever been. Now, here's what is corroborative evidence that's convinced convinced me and convinced so many skeptical doctors as well. When people leave their body, initially, they're still in the vicinity of where their resuscitation or their physical death happened. And um, as a result, when they come back, when they're resuscitated, they can describe things that can be checked out. So for instance, one of the cardiologists I interviewed, uh, Dr. Michael Sabum, he didn't believe in any, any of this stuff. He, in, in fact, he, he set out to disprove near-death experiences. So he starts interviewing his patients who had had cardiac arrests. And when he starts asking them, they do start recounting these similar stories and occurrences. And for instance, one guy explained how Sabum did his resuscitation and Sabum later said, I could have used the tape to teach other physicians how to do resuscitation. Wow. And, and by the way, this is, this is common. So, you know, 900 scholarly articles have been written about this phenomena in the journal, of the medical, uh, American medical association, Uh, The Lancet, which is Europe's most prestigious medical journal, psychiatry. And they record stories like this as evidence. For instance, in The Lancet in Europe, there was this Dutch patient that was brought into the hospital. He was unconscious. His heart had stopped beating. He's brought into the ER. They're about to intubate him. And the nurse realizes he he has dentures. So the nurse takes out the dentures, puts him in the lower drawer of, of this crash cart, And then they intubate him, they get his heart going again, but he never comes to in the ER. They take him to another room. A week later, he comes to. And he sees that nurse and he says, that nurse knows where my dentures are. They they had lost his dentures. And then he describes that everybody who was in the doctors, what they were wearing, the nurses. uh, And he said, that nurse put my dentures in the in that drawer down under on the, the cart with all the bottles on it. And they, that's where they found his dentures. See, that is incredible. And I know I was recently speaking um, with Lee Strobel, who told me a story about, um, I think it was somebody who had had a heart attack or they were you know experiencing a near death experience and they floated up to the roof of the hospital and saw these shoes or something on the roof. And then of course, same thing they come to later and they're explaining what was on the roof of the hospital. They could have never known they had never been on the roof and it was, uh, you know, an identical description when they went up to look to see what was up there. I mean, you see these pieces of evidence. It actually wasn't, it actually wasn't on the roof. It was on a window ledge outside. So, you know, it couldn't even have, yeah, and, and there, there are tons of stories like this, and, and, and it's not just stories. So um, there have been researchers, uh, professors, uh, who have done studies to say, take um, patients who claim to have had a near-death experience and all of their observations. So, you know, record all the observations they claim to have outside their bodies, and then a control group that did not claim to have a near death experience and you know what they imagine might be have been happening in the room of their resuscitation and what they found is the the control group got almost none of them right 10 15% it was just like guessing 
the NDE group of all their hundreds of observations, 92% were completely accurate. Uh, another 6% were, were somewhat accurate. In other words, they might've had one or two details off. Only 2% were, were inaccurate. Wow. So that's and- uncanny. I mean, and, and, and this is what has convinced so many skeptical doctors. And imagine heaven, I do a whole chapter, skeptical doctors in the afterlife. And I, and I show that this is corroborative evidence of exactly what uh, Paul taught us, that you know we're, our bodies are buried in weakness, but they're raised in power. They're, they're buried natural bodies, but they're raised spiritual bodies. And that's what these people say. You know, it's interesting um, because so many of these stories, like 90 Minutes in Heaven, they, they've they captivated people, right? And they, it's interesting to me as a journalist, as somebody who's looked at a lot of these stories, interviewed a lot of the people, and obviously you've interviewed even more people than I have on this topic and looked at all of the data and the information. There seems to be some who say, oh, you know, these stories are not biblical. You'll hear that. You'll hear that a lot. And I, and I don't often hear the specific explanations of why people think that's the case, but how would you respond to somebody? And you just started to kind of talk about that, but who says, no, 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 these stories are not biblical. Read, imagine heaven. (laughs) You're going to get more Bible. You're going to, you're going to see more of what the Bible says about the life to come than you've ever imagined. Hmm. Um, And and let me just give you, I'll just give you a a quick run through of the commonalities of what people say in these near-death experiences. So I've already given you the the new spiritual body and, and Paul is talking about that, but there are other aspects. For instance, you know, yes, some of the things when I first started studying it, I was like, oh, that's really out there. That's really new agey, weird, you know, whatever, which is why it took me 35 years to write this, (laughs) you know, because I knew Christians kind of pushed this away. They don't understand it. They've pushed it away. And it took me a long time. And quite honestly, it took Christians coming out about their near-death experiences because they were hiding um, until Don Piper came forward, uh, the, the guy who uh, did 90 minutes in heaven. Right. But there are things that they say, like, for instance, they, there is a welcoming committee many times of, of deceased loved ones and friends who come and welcome them. You rec- you recognize each other, you know, you're yourselves. Many times, um, you're wearing clothes like you would recognize, you know, one guy, one bank president, uh, said I was wearing my favorite golf outfit, right? <laughs> But they also talk about how sometimes they, they see them and they are shining like brilliant. Like there's this light that is love coming out of these people. And at first I was like, oh, that's kind of weird, right? But then you really dive into studying the Bible. Daniel chapter 12, the angel t- tells Daniel, um, and at the resurrection, you know, many will be resurrected uh, you know, and the righteous will shine like the stars forever. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 13, 43. And, and then the righteous will shine like the sun in, the, in their father's kingdom forever. Philippians 2, 15, same kind of thing. And in Imagine Heaven, I show how I believe that this is actually also what Paul meant uh, in Romans chapter 8 when it said we will share in God's glory. Because God's glory is this light and love and life that shines out of God. And it's not like the light of the sun. It's like life and more brilliant than a thousand suns. But all these things are actually in the Bible. What people say they experience, they oftentimes travel. So after they observe their resuscitation or their, you know, what's going on in the trying to resuscitate them, they will travel. Some say through a tunnel, others it's like a pathway of, of light. It's not all the same. Um, it's been stereotyped, but it's not all the same. And they come to a place that is much like Earth's beauty, but so much more. Um, and again, experience not in five senses, but more like 50 senses. But they see grass and flowers and trees and mountains and streams, this, this glorious city many times. But Far beyond. I mean, there are things they recognize from earth, but far beyond that as well. Well, if you go read the book of Revelation, all that's there. 
it's all there. So it's, it's not a shock. Um, yeah. They talk often about uh, this light that is love coming out of everything. Um, and by the way, even blind people say the same thing. That so, is compelling to me. So speak to that because people who have never seen, people who are blind, who have never seen anything on earth having these experiences, that I think is one of the most compelling parts of this. Yeah. And then imagine heaven. I, I, I have three blind people um, that are describing this experience they've never, ever seen. And yet they're describing this beauty, this beautiful place, just like everyone else. They're describing that this light is love and life, and it's coming out of the trees. It's coming out of the birds. It's coming out of the people. And now a blind person would never have heard that description of how light works. Hmm. So why in the world would they say that that's the way that light works in heaven? Okay, now you might say, oh, again, that, that's not biblical. Oh, it's absolutely. Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah says in the, the new heavens and earth, there's, there's no need of the sun or moon for the glory of God is the light. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. Uh, John says, uh, there's no sun or moon in heaven for God is its light and Jesus, the lamb, is its lamp and the nations will walk in that light. Wow. It, it, it's, it's, it's right there. And blind people are saying what the Bible's been saying all along. And that's the thing that just, that's why I, I say this is a new apologetic for a global world because people all around the globe. Now, another thing that's kind of throws Christians sometimes is all around the globe. These people also encounter this God of light and love who is personal, not a force, a person knows their every thought and motive. And yet in his presence, they feel this unconditional love like they've never known before. And those who know Jesus know he's Jesus. Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice. They know me. Um, but Jesus said, I am the light of the world. <laughs> Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, will have the light of life. This is the same God that Daniel saw, that Ezekiel, Paul, John, you know, on the island of Patmos. And what, what I think sometimes throws Christians is like, well, if, 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 they don't, if they don't know Jesus, why are they seeing God? Well, Revelation 1-7 tells us every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Mm. So... We shouldn't be shocked. And by the way, Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, was not a believer when he saw this brilliant God of light. That's a really interesting point. Go read Acts chapter 9. He was not a believer. Yeah. And this is another very important thing because people say, well, these near-death experiencers report that in the presence of God, they just felt so much love, but he doesn't tell them he's Jesus and he doesn't preach the gospel. Well, go read Acts 9, you know? All Jesus said when Paul asked, who are you, Lord? Only when he asked, right? He said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now, Jesus didn't tell him the gospel. What did he say? He said, go into the city. You'll find out what you need to do. And he sends Ananias to Paul. Because this has always been God's MO. It's always been his, his way is to use people to help people understand who he is and who he's revealed himself to be. And that's important to realize Paul still could have rejected Jesus. You know, Ananias said, you got, you've got to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Paul could have said, uh-uh. And just because someone has a near-death experience, it doesn't take away their choice or their free will. And they can come back and still reject Jesus, or they can come back and seek this God of light and love and find him. And yeah. you see both. See, that's that's really incredible. And we know that there are plenty of stories of this being sort of a, a wake-up call for people or a strengthen of their faith going through this kind of experience. Now, my final question for you on this, and there's so much to talk about. I'm going to have to have you back again to dig into this uh, because it's it's such a... It's such a rich topic, and I love that you call it a new apologetic. I think it's it's such an interesting way of looking at at it and what it really has done for people. Look at the movies and the books, books like yours, Imagine Heaven, and all the films that are out there, like 90 Minutes in Heaven, that have instilled faith in thousands, if not millions, of other people who didn't go through the experience, right? I mean, it really 
it really has been transformational to get people thinking more about what's to come. What what is eternity? What does life look like after this? But my final question for you is what is your hope for your book specifically and your research? At the end of the day, when people look back at what you've done in this space, what are you hoping they see and learn? Same thing I did. You know, on the one hand, before I was a believer, I, I, I started to see that God has given evidence of, of his reality, and it opened me up to that. So this is modern medical scientific evidence that the God of the Bible is, is real. And what I hope to do is show that this is, not, this is not the God that you would expect from other religious uh, understandings of, of heaven or of God. This is the God of all nations you know, that Jesus came for. And then for Christians, you know, what it did for me is it, it showed me the things, it showed me the things that, um, like in Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith had their minds set on a heavenly country, not on this one. You know, Colossians 3, 1 says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. And honestly, Billy, too many Christians have their minds set on retirement because they can imagine it but they're not living for the life to come because they don't honestly think much of it. And mm-hmm. so I, that's why I, the other reason I wrote imagine heaven is because by the end of it, you know, I, I have over 120 of these people's experiences and you hear through their eyes, what the scriptures are saying. And then all of a sudden you, you feel like you've been there and you realize, Oh my gosh, I want to live this life better. You know, I want to live this life to do God's will more because it all connects. It's continuous, you know, and and life is going to continue on. And that's really the life to live for. And so it changes how we live this life. And that's my hope as well. Well, listen, I so appreciate you taking the time today. And anybody who is watching or listening to this, check out Imagine Heaven. Thanks so much today. Thanks, Billy. Great being with you. 